Welcome back. As we continue the exploration of Soft's relationship with technology, I would like to introduce JSAL's Dr. Bill Nahr, a JSAL non-resident senior fellow and faculty member at the National Intelligence University. Dr. Nahr, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. A good morning, panel and audience. My name is Bill Nahr, and this is session two of topic three, Soft's relationship with technology. Now, before we begin, let me introduce the panel. You've had an opportunity to read the bios, but let me emphasize the diversity of the panelists' background. Mr. Mark Newt served in the Army in active and reserve capacities in the 101st, 75th Rangers, and Special Forces, and mobilized as an operations officer in support of soft counter-ISIS efforts. He has multiple combat tours of the Middle East and Central Asia, after 9-11, Captain, then Captain Nooch, led one of the first Task Force Dagger Special Operations teams with combat controllers and CIA into northern Afghanistan. The team spearheaded unconventional warfare operations in the north, uniting three different resistance factions against the Taliban and al-Qaeda, and ultimately liberating Mazari Sharif. The liberation of Mazari Sharif, Mazari Sharif led to the downfall of enemy forces in the north and was the was the catalyst for the Taliban regime collapse. Mark and the ODA 595 horse soldiers are the design inspiration of the America's Response Monument, a tribute to the soft and intelligence community. He and his team are featured in the book, The Horse Soldiers and the film 12 Strong. Colonel Mark Zace, PhD, is the Chief Data and Scientist at US Special Operations Command. Mark has over 23 years of military service as an Army aviator and operations research systems analyst. Mark spent the first part of his career in multiple assignments as a Longbow Apache HAH-64D aviator before transitioning to the operations research military specialty. His academic and professional research focuses on data science, machine learning, meta heuristics, and simulation optimization. Mark has a degree in operations research from the United States Military Academy, master's degrees in operations research and industrial engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and a PhD in operations research from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Dr. Peter Singer is a strategist at New America, a professor of practice at Arizona State University, and principal at Useful Fiction LLC described in the Wall Street Journal as the premier futurist in the national security environment. He has been named by the Smithsonian as one of the nation's 100 leading innovators, by Defense News as one of the 100 most influential people in defense issues, by foreign policy to their top 100 global thinkers list, as an official, an official mad scientist for the U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command, TRADOC. No author, living or dead, has more books on the professional U.S. military reading list. He is also the co-author of a new type of novel using the format of a techno thriller to communicate nonfiction research. His latest is Burn In, a novel of the real robotic revolution. It has been described as a visionary new form of storytelling, a roller coaster ride of science fiction blended with science fact. Science fact. Well, thank you very much, panelists, for being here today. Let me. Uh, let me let me uh, bring together this with, with, with some of the questions that have been uh, presented to us. Now, as you can see, we have assembled a, man, a, a panel of diverse backgrounds, an operator, a chief data scientist, and a premier strategist mad scientist. Now, the power of this panel is that they each bring a very different perspective. So for the first question, in considering soft utility and the soft truth that humans are more important than hardware, what are the limits of technology and soft operations? Now, I'm gonna direct that first question to Mark Nooch. Mark, do you have a response, please? You're muted. Thank you, Dr. Nahr, and uh, good morning to the conference attendees. Uh, as we talk about uh, with the soft truths, number one, that people are not equipment make the critical difference. Uh, the right teams of people, highly trained, uh, will accomplish the mission when the equipment fails, when there's chaos on the battlefield, and the best equipment in the world cannot compensate for having the lack of the right people at the critical moment on that battlefield. 
I want to take you back briefly to uh, our post 9-11 uh, 2001 operations. There was no existing plan. Uh, all the headquarters at every level are working to understand the enemy, Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, the situation on the ground, who are the friendly factions. Uh, and as my team was tasked as one of the initial special forces teams to enter into Afghanistan, as we were in that isolation planning phase, we recognized there are so many questions that are unanswered and no one for weeks has been able to provide information. We realized it's got to be people on the ground. And we let our chain of command know to send me, send us. We're the team that's confident in our training and our experience to insert us as one of those first teams. There, as I said, so many unanswered questions. Uh, in the midst of this austere battlefield chaos, it is soft teams that understand the mission, the commander's intent, and the end state. And they are the ones on the ground who we rely on to figure it out, place themselves and their resources at the most critical points on the battlefield to apply those essential technologies and resources to solve the problem, win, and survive. Soft teams do this through centralized planning and decentralized execution. In post 9-11, there was no one outside of the special forces and interagency combined teams on the ground who could figure it out. Uh, you could call for help, you could call for reinforcements at the task force dagger headquarters that was 150 miles away. You could talk to you know, Fort Campbell, you could talk to the lo logistical planners, you could talk back to uh, McDill or CENTCOM, uh, to either SOCOM or CENTCOM there. But there's no one in those headquarters outside of the combined interagency teams on the ground that, that could help you solve that immediate problem and survive the next five minutes, survive the hour, and win that battle that day. So we we're all working together, united uh, in that fight. Uh, we understood each other's authorities and limitations. Uh, and we were able to leverage those uh, to win on the battlefield. We recognized what had to be done. In the case of my team, we split into three-man cells uh, with initially just Green Berets uh, in three-man cells that were matched with an Afghan commander that had between 300 to 750 militia fighters. Eventually, we would get a couple of the combat controllers attached to us, and we would split my 14-man team into four three-man cells. And each three-man cell matched with that Afghan commander was dispersed into different counties. I even had one three-man cell that was 14 days on their own, and they were in another province. So we were relying on them to provide that information. And, and it just became, by having us there, it became a... a a sponge of show, soaking up all this information uh, from the different local populace, the different ethnic leaders uh, that were able to help provide answers and information. Now, I got to remind people that this is in the time when there were no UAVs overhead 24-7. Uh, there was no full motion video downlink to the teams on the ground. Uh, this is the days before Blue Force Tracker. So we actually had two main communication windows throughout the day where our team would come up and make comms through our primary alternate contingency or emergency communications plan. We'd make those comms with the task force dagger headquarters. In other words, how we fight now, as you all well know, uh, there was not that real time commander overhead or uh, commander situational awareness in your hip pocket. And I think there's definitely some lessons learned from even that post 9-11, 2001 period that certainly apply to today's threats that, that our uh, Department of Defense and SOCOM is pivoting towards with these near peer threats. Uh, because of that electronic signature that these teams emit, our commanders are going to have to rely on our soft team's understanding of the intent and end state. Otherwise, our teams are not going to survive as easily on the battlefield. But, uh, I also want to mention American presence. 
is what provided hope to the Afghan people. By having our American SOF and interagency partners on the ground, that is immeasurable. It demonstrates commitment and willingness to share the battlefield living conditions and the dangers. It shows the U.S. has skin in the game and that you are willing to stand alongside these allies. And that is immeasurable. I've seen that in other, in other places in Africa, in, in uh, Syria, or with our Kurdish allies. That is immeasurable by having American presence on the ground. Now, these soft teams are obviously, as we know, are able to leverage those critical enablers, the technology that we do provide. In the case of my mission, you know, we had a 19th century force on horseback that are armed with 20th century weapons. And my special forces team and the combat controllers and the interagency team, we bring in the 21st century technology. The communications and the SATCOM ability to is what allowed our team to split out and help to provide that situational awareness. I want to tell you that the most, you know, you've seen the movies, you've seen the books about all the close air support. And yes, that was absolutely essential. But the most important thing that happened is that actually on the 28th of October, the agency team and my special forces team, we got three different ethnic faction leaders to come together and sit down in a three-day area commander's meeting. And that took our force from 300 militia fighters to 3,000 militia fighters to uniting these factions and raising an army of over 5,000 militia fighters and orchestrating an uprising across the five northern provinces. That is the real power of what our combined interagency and SF team did in that case. Dr. Nara, I'll turn it back over to you. You were me to be Bill. No, let me try it again. Colonel Zays, we've talked about the limits of technology and soft operations, but sometimes those limitations can be in our own mind, one of understanding. One of the read aheads that you offered was entitled Frontline Geek Squad, SOCOM Secret Weapon, that addresses the deployment of data scientists like yourself alongside special operations forces to help solve various problems such as intelligence sharing. Most important was how the special operations Sergeant Major found religion when he realized how important that linkage was. So let me ask you, how do we strengthen that linkage? How do we demystify AI for senior leaders and soft, soft operators? Thanks for, first of all, thanks for inviting me to this panel. Um, as mentioned before, I don't have the, the, the soft expertise as, as Mark or the writing acumen of of Peter, but I definitely, which I, I read Vernon, by the way, great book. Um, but I, you know, so I come at it from a very um, practitioner perspective and, and data science perspective. And first, before um, kind of the, your question about um, kind of demystifying AI, just to your previous question to, to Mark, and you know, kind of an overarching comment about um, the limits of technology um, and soft operations, you know, kind of an overarching statement, it's, you know, you know, it's not, you know, it's not something that I came up with, but it's, you know, something I echo is that war itself is about, you know, is about decision making and AI is just enabling technology to transform how humans and machines make those decisions. And so the idea of um, the goal should never to completely remove the human from the loop. Um, with that said, to the demystifying AI, that's kind of, I guess my answer to that is, um, you know, I, as I, and the more I think about it is, my answer to that question is different today than it would, would have been about one to two years ago. Um, you know, previously I might have, a couple of years ago, might've been trying to, you know, talk about how senior leaders can, in, and others um, can embrace AI, but, you know, I think it's, you know, I think it's embraced to the point um, where now it's, a, it's, you know, and sometimes you have to dial it back, you are more likely to hear something, a comment like we need to do more AI, whatever that means as opposed to um, what is AI. Um, so I guess, you know, in some ways my answers are, um, because I'm a very a practitioner perspective, it's, you know, my answers are somewhat more practical than idealistic, which 
which isn't to be you know misinterpreted as being like skeptical or unoptimistic, but I think the, the biggest one of the biggest challenges right now is is managing expectations um, and hype. Um, you, know, you might be familiar with uh, a, a, a gentleman named Andrew Ng, who uh, you know, he's got a, a, a pretty lengthy resume. Um, founded uh, Google Brain, um, co-founder of Coursera, um, a big player in the field of AI. But you know, it's, I think it was a, a couple of years ago, he posted on Twitter that we need a Goldilocks rule for AI. And the way he explains his Goldilocks rule for AI is you know, too optimistic. And he's, he's been specific about deep learning. He said, you know, the too optimistic would be deep learning gives us a clear path to artificial general intelligence. Too pessimistic is, um, you know, it, it has limitations. Here comes the next AI winner. And just right is that um, what he stated is deep learning can't do everything, but it'll improve countless lives and create massive economic growth. That could be replaced with, you know, make a, you know, operations more efficient, um, obviously save, you know, um, lives in combat and um, be um, more lethal. So some of the things, um, you know, to the demystifying theme, I guess, some of the things that you know, people constantly hear me talk about is, um, well, there's a few things. One is, or several things. One is, uh, you know, I'll constantly say, um, this is where I get to being more practical, is being cautious about searching, not searching for AI solutions to every problem. Um, every problem doesn't doesn't have or require an AI solution. Sometimes it's just, you know, something less than AI will make it efficient. Um, also, um, there's a tendency to jump straight to technology, um, uh, you know, lack of a better term, to the kind of sexy solutions and, and applications of AI, whether it's you know, sensor to shooter or something, um, you know, drone technology. Um, but people, people around me a lot will hear me talk about the other stuff a lot more, um, the enabling part. You know, I constantly talk about not necessarily the AI applications, but about data architecture and infrastructure. Um, you know, essentially all the things that we need to get to um, those applications. Um, also, a common it seems like every time we, you know, we talk or or present something um, in terms of, or demonstrate a capability, you know, I will repeatedly ask, "Can we do this on our network?" Nine out of ten times. You know, we'll say we, we can't, you know, we did it, you know, off of uh, um, our network or even the DOD network, which isn't to, you know, that's how um, progress is made. Um, you know, we, you know, not saying, you know, I think that's the, you know, that's the way that we'll develop and innovate quickly um, because there are so many challenges um, within the DOD structure. Um, but if we focus too much on the stories at the edge, you know, sometimes, you know, I comment, often say it can create an illusion of progress. Um, and, and by that, I just mean we, you know, um, it's not just highlight the things, you know, we want to make the, our capabilities reach all the way back um, from the edge, all the way back to the center. Um, you know, I mentioned not making AI sexy. It doesn't always have to be sexy. There's, you know, a lot of times, you know, we just need to focus on, um, can we improve efficiency and decision makings in all domains? Um, and all by all domains, it's you know, there are a lot of things in you know, in the obvious use cases and in, in terms of intelligence operations. Um, but there's also many things, whether it's maintenance, personnel. Um, there's all kinds of applications that, that focus on that are not necessarily um, sexy. Example I give um, is a you know, this is kind of um, it's kind of the extreme opposite way, but it's kind of a, to illustrate my frustration sometimes is I'll sit in a lot of meetings and we'll talk about, um, you know, all the important thing, the concepts, whether it's, you know, JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control, Sensor Shooter, um, all the, the grand visions. And then, you know, we'll have documents or charters or things that we need to staff. And then it'll come to me in our TMT tracking system. And then I realize, you know, and what happens is we, We'll send a document or get you know staffed out and to a point where if I'm on the receiving end, um, I have to download it from SharePoint. Um, I can't put comments into the actual system. I've got to actually download an Excel spreadsheet to put 
written word comments in. And then I put my comments in an Excel spreadsheet and then I upload that back to a system. So on the other end, you know, downloads dozens of Excel spreadsheets and then consolidates all those into, um, into another spreadsheet, which who knows where it goes from there. Um, you know, it's a very simplistic process, but as an example to me, like, you know, if, you know, if we can't fix, you know, if we, we don't fix things like that. If we don't care about things, you know, automating the easy stuff, um, you know, we won't be able to basically make it, you know, an enterprise uh, focus. So it's, it, you know, it's an example of frustration, but just, see, you know, I just, I point that out because it's an example of, um, we've all got to care about all the aspects of it. And uh, um, I guess, uh, you know, lastly, I'd say another, comment I make as far as the demystification thing is just um, one of the things I'm consistently um, pushing or kind of on a, um, I guess my technical jihad is, is decoupling the term AI slash ML, um, you, know, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, you know, most people are probably aware that machine learning is a subset of, of, of artificial intelligence, but uh, machine learning is a, is it, an approach to enabling AI technology and that the technology surrounding um, involved with AI is, is so much broader than, than machine learning. So it's one of the things that if we can educate people on all the different aspects of AI and the difference in, um, you know, whether it's um, the description, the actions, whether it's data engineering versus data science and other things, um, that's kind of the first approach to demystifying it. And, um, I know it's a long, complex answer, but there's there's a lot of pieces to it. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Colonel Colonel Ace. Uh, uh, Dr. Singer, now we've talked about the past and what might we learn from case studies such as Missouri Sharif. We've talked about the present and how some of the limitations are in understanding how technologies can help. Now I'd like you to talk about the future, specifically a fictional future you know, as introduced in the read ahead, thinking the unthinkable with useful fiction. You've started some new work in helping to visualize future in new ways. What is your, what is useful fiction as you call it and how might it be of interest to soft the, the soft community? So, thank you. Um, it's interesting later today, I'm gonna to be doing an event with our um, partners in Australia and the commander of the um, Australian army has as the core uh, priority sums it up in a way that um, I think is an interesting turn of phrase and it very much applies to this conference, but the larger soft enterprise where he says that their core task, their core challenge is to be quote, ready now and future ready. And when we think about, you know, how do we go after that to be ready now and future ready, it's incredibly challenging given all the different changes, uh, trends, technologies that are swirling around us that we've talked about on this panel, but we also heard about on the prior sessions. You know, when you think about political shifts, new technologies that are straight out of science fiction, uh, you name it. Um, but within that, to me, there's basically two questions that leaders uh, and those that train our leaders of today and tomorrow are wrestling with. One is, um, as Colonel Zayce laid out, is the challenge of understanding or comprehension. Uh, so to use that specific topic of AI, you know, we've moved past people um, needing to realize it's important. Uh, a study of um, civilian leaders, but I think the numbers carry over to the mil military side, 91% of leaders said that AI is the most important game-changing technology out there. 91% of leaders said, this is huge. 17% self-report that they understand it. That is a massive delta between leaders saying, this is important, 91%, 17% saying, I get it. So first you have the understanding side. Then you have the visualization side of it. Okay, not just do I understand it, but how will it be used? How will it matter in the context that I care about? And so um, what August Cole and myself have gone after is a new approach to trying to hit this need of understanding 
and visualization. And we call it useful fiction, or sometimes it's called thick in short for fictional intelligence. And it is the, it's not science fiction. It's not just dreaming things up. It is the deliberate fusion of nonfiction research and documents into narrative. So you're bringing together the education with the entertainment side. Um, in many ways, I liken it to uh, something that um, I did to my kids this morning. I do it to them every morning. I sneak fruit and veggies into their morning smoothie. So it's not a milkshake. It's not sci-fi. It's not just um, tasty. Uh, it's not you know uh, a chalky uh, um, you know pill or a diet drink. It's a smoothie. It's bringing the good stuff together, but they still enjoy it. And it's doing the same thing except for um, adults uh, and particular members of the military who are tired of reading or won't read uh, lengthy white papers or documents, uh, you name it. So, you know, going back to the topic of um, AI, there was an incredible recent um, report uh, by the U.S. government on prioritizing uh, AI. It's an amazing report. Um, it's going to set uh, what we're supposed to do in the years ahead. It's 756 pages good luck in getting most people to read that. So the attributes of useful fiction, this, this smoothie, this combination of narrative and nonfiction um, basically has three value propositions uh, that I think are really useful. And we've, we've done it in our, as you mentioned, in our own writing um, in Burn In and Ghost Fleet, but we've also done it uh, for clients, for organizations uh, on their topics that they care about. So this project with the Australian Defense Forces is a um, conversion of their strategic plan for um, the future of professional military education in Australia. We did a cybersecurity project for the US Congress. Uh, we're working on another project with the Navy on um, ex what expeditionary warfare looks like moving forward. But basically, as you look across these different examples, there's three attributes of useful fiction. Um, one is that uh, research shows that Packaging something within a narrative is a more effective means of carrying across new ideas, new information. Uh, it's basically the way our brains are wired. When you are exposed to new information through a speech or a PowerPoint or a memo, two parts of your brain light up. When you get that same information, but through a narrative, four parts of your brain light up. And it's essentially due to evolution. Um, narrative story is the oldest, arguably, communication technology of all. Uh, we were using it when we were gathered around fires and caves. Um, PowerPoint, it's 30 years old. Uh, so our brains are not wired for it. The second value of useful fiction of narrative is emotion. Um, is everyone from politicians to used car salesmen know it's not just the facts, it's emotion that drives the sale. It's emotion that causes the reaction. And then the final value proposition of useful fiction is um, uh, attention and um, connection and distribution. It's um, one of the interesting things uh, that I thought was fascinating about, you know, looking back at, um, you know, the period around 2001 to today is that we've gone from a world of information scarcity to info overload. Everyone is just surrounded by data swirling around us, asking for our attention, whether it's in our email boxes, social media, you name it. So you first um, have to get people willing to read what you're putting out there. And it's a very different ask of someone, you know, as I mentioned here, read this white paper, read this 750 page report versus, hey, get the same information, but through a story. Um, but it's not just about the ask, it's that the target audience then does the work for you on the distribution. Because here again, as humans, we connect over story. Uh, when we meet someone new, when we um, link up to an old friend or colleague, we often talk about a story, a movie, a TV show that we recently enjoyed. Um, here again, a, another way of uh, putting it is, you know, no one came back from a, a work trip or a vacation and said, oh man, I read the best PowerPoint on the flight back. You would just love it. 
but they will do that for a story. Uh, and the, the they is, again, everything from junior officers all the way up to four stars. We've experienced this. So I think it's a very valuable new kind of toolkit to apply to these problems of comprehension and visualization. Thank you very much, Peter. Hey, let's move on to this next question then. Uh, the question two that we were, were given is, how do we distinguish between problems that involve technology and problems that involve people? Uh, Mark Nooch, could you, could you uh, respond to that, please? Well, Dr. Nar, my response to that is, is unfortunately, is there's not always a clear cut answer. Uh, oftentimes, from my experience, it involves both. Uh, you do need that technology and those resources uh, that allow you know you to uh, far exceed the numbers you may have on the ground as a small soft team, uh, but yet it's it is every day it is that daily interaction with your counterparts, helping to understand their capabilities, their motivations, their agendas, uh, and and help provide that analysis up through intelligence reporting and things that, that just pure sensors are not able to understand, you know, what your allies or even opponents may be thinking. It's uh, uh, the technology, uh, you know, again, in the case of our experience, the power management was such a challenge with in that austere environment of managing uh, our radio batteries. And I know there was a number of uh, later panels, defense science boards and things uh, that my teammates and I and others were invited to participate in, you know, with, with micro technologies and, you know, ideas about power. I know now we have electric cars and Tesla's doing so many amazing things and, and NASA just put a rover, you know, on Mars. You know, obviously, these other agencies have some ideas about power management, uh, power regeneration. That I hope some folks, smart folks in SOCOM, are uh, talking with those as well about how to solve these power issues for all the technologies that that are fielded to our soft teams. Uh, we got to recognize that these technologies give off a signature, and again, in a near peer type of environment those signatures uh, and that uh, electronic footprint could be absolutely lethal or devastating uh, to our soft teams on the ground. Uh, I, I, you know, go from that to, you know, some of the, the advancements in calling in close air support and the digital technologies that have been developed to help eliminate uh, some of the man in the loop uh, mistakes that, that were experienced back in 2001. We had two uh, nearly similar of uh, friendly fire incidents in late November uh, in northern Afghanistan in the Kuala Jengi battle. Uh, but then less than 10 days later, there was a similar friendly fire incident uh, with another soft team on the ground. And at that point, you know, the, the digital, the coordinates that you were passing were being passed uh, verbally, not digitally. Uh, there were also issues of training on newly fielded systems that had been uh, put into the hands of our soft teams right before deploying. So all those things that we know and these lessons and how we field these technologies and shaking them out before they are deployed. But I also, in my other experience, I've seen the, the power, the immense power of having experienced operators working with uh, the, the smart engineers and folks that are developing these new technologies and getting them out into the field early uh, to shake it out, you know, does it, does it meet the E5 GI in the field test, you know, and I know I've frustrated some MIT and John Hopkins uh, engineers over the years because I, I could break their, their toy and their widget uh, uh, frustratingly for them. And then they would repair it and I'd break it again. But uh, I definitely saw the power of having all of these analytical capabilities forward uh, where we can fuse the different intelligence uh, that we have to help our battlefield commanders understand what they are faced with on the ground or what, what the population is doing. 
Ultimately, though, what I saw missing from that synergy of SIGINT and full motion video and, and the ground radars and everything else that was happening is the lack of, hey, did anybody go downtown and talk to the Afghan national police or some of the Afghan locals? They know where the Taliban's at. They know their name. They know where they live. You know, and that became something I felt like was missing into that overall intelligence understanding of what our commanders have faced. Uh, as you know, you see other things now with with uh, you know renowned cyber companies or other major national businesses that their databases are getting hacked. You know, is that a threat to our Blue Force trackers, our secure comms, our precision fire coordination? Uh, we've become probably more reliant on technology and hardware at any other point uh, in our history. And, you know, what happens when Murphy sews up as it's going to happen? There will be chaos on the battlefield, and that is going to require a human to react uh, it's going to require leadership to organize the resources at hand and address that problem immediately. Hardware certainly is an enabler in all of that. Our ability to dominate communications, uh, to dominate with our night vision technologies. Uh, but ultimately, our soft teams have to be able to execute whether online or offline. You know, and that to me means I still need a guy a serviceman or woman that can understand and navigate with a map and a compass. Yes, they've got a GPS. Yes, they've got all these Blue Force tracking technologies, but I need them to be capable of operate off the grid and offline. And I know our commanders and our policymakers expect, expect that. Uh, where SOF is going to be deploying in the future doing whatever that mission is, whether that's FID or another UW type of mission in these third world countries, we're gonna be battling not only that local insurgency groups, but there's gonna be other First Nation or near US peer competitors. They're gonna be utilizing those forces as proxies. And so our, our teams are gonna to have to, uh, regardless of that mission set and where they're at, they're gonna to have to be cognizant of what on the surface may be uh, that particular type of mission, but there's going to be near peer competitors uh, advising our opponents or providing our opponents with uh, near peer technologies regarding electronic warfare and uh, uh, able to counter or defeat some of our technology. I mean, look, look even at the Taliban uh, and how uh, they obviously place more emphasis in the, the importance of humans on the, on the battlefield and what they've been able to do uh, in fighting against us in, in Afghanistan. But uh, I thank you for the few minutes to offer up some comments. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Colonel Zace, now we've talked about technology integration issues at the operator and team level, but let's take that to a higher level. How does the joint service-like soft environment affect SOCOM's relationship with technology and its ability to lead in innovation? Thanks, Bill. Um, well, the short answer is that this, that dynamic makes, um, makes things a lot harder, but it makes our, um, I think it makes our solutions a lot more valuable. Um, I tell people that, uh, you know, if you can do, you know, just from a data science perspective, or you know, I'm a machine learning engineer. If you can do it in DoD, or especially um, break through the hurdles at SOCOM, um, you can you can do it anywhere. Um, you know, I've gone back and forth, you know, between academia and DoD, and you know, that's one of the you know immediate observations is um, one the different barriers and obstacles, and um, and Two, you know, kind of the lack of awareness, you know, on the other side that a lot of those exist. Um, you know, most people don't have to mirror their capabilities and solutions on, on four or more impact levels, um, as an example. Um, you know, so, you know, as I said, it's, you know, makes it, you know, harder, but also more valuable. Um, you know, I think, you know, because it's not just the, the architecture or the um, talent management 
or our governance, um, we're in a, actually a, in a unique solution or unique position to to lead and innovate and and actually to um, SOCOM solutions. I think have the ability to help DoD um, at writ large more than some of the other um, individual services. Um, you know, we kind of often you know a lot of these difficulties. We ask ourselves, you know, in this environment, why is it so difficult to um, to put in good practice, um, managing data, um, accessing data, conducting data science or artificial intelligence. Um, and a good example of this um, complexity and kind of our unique position is um, just to give a real world example is a lot of folks are familiar with the 160th um, Special Operations Regiment Predictive Maintenance um, project that they did is, which was one of the first initiatives or projects um, that, that Jake, initial project that Jake um, joined our official intelligence center took on. Um, and it was focused on the um, you know, predictive maintenance of, of, um, you know, of engines in, in 160th. And, um, and they did great work and they've, and they've produced some, um, some great solutions. And one of the things that the observations from it, or when you look at it is it's the, uh, is, well, First of all, take that step back. We're doing a similar um, a similar effort, which we started later, which is on the Air Force, um, trying to leverage this work on the Air Force side with the um, MB-22, which is the AFSOC version of CB-22. Mm -hmm. And when we compare it with that 160th solution is the, um, you know, one of the things that 160th was dealing with is they're in a, they're in a um, mostly compartmentalized um, Army environment, Army, personnel, um, Army equipment, Army data. Um, whereas when we look at the MB-22 and a lot of special, you know, you know, SOCOM at large projects, um, SOCOM is a joint microcosm um, of DOD. So at the, with the MB-22, um, what we found out is there were so many, there's been so many different obstacles that we wouldn't have necessarily expected. Um, of course, it's an Air Force, um, unit and uh it turns out that it's with the mb-22 the um you know, the aircraft is of course owned by the the air force a lot of the maintenance data is owned by the air force but the sensor data which we're using sensors to actually predict for predictive maintenance on swash plate actu actuators all the sensor data is, sensor data across the aircraft is owned by the navy um, this creates complicated governance because you've got the um We've got some data um, owned by the Navy, some data owned by the, the Air Force. Um, you have different architectures. You have different um, you have different networks. Um, you end up asking how is how is data going to be shared? Where's shared? Where's it going to be lived? Um, we have subject matter experts that are in different services. Um, then we have to ask ourselves where are we going to deploy this um, a solution or a model, um, and where. So. Um, that's just an example of the microcosm that you know when you talk about um, when you produce a um, a soft um, enterprise solution, it kind of on a smaller scale mirrors um, the complexities of the DoD version, um, which kind of you know I think one of the big takeaways, and I think one of the things that it's actually been um, recently publicized by Jake is that they're shifting their efforts to. Um, the ability to scale, because what we found is the most useful um, AI efforts have the ability to um, scale, and and if they have the ability to scale, they can help the um, DoD um, at the most, and you know optimize um, the the help with you know the effort and costs. Um, so I guess to to wrap it up, I, I think um, you know. As we approach all these these complex solutions in in um, in SOCOM, you know, from putting my you know my data science hat on, the way a lot of these technology problems are are very the way we approach them are very similar to the fundamentals of a of a data science problem that we preach um, you know in academia or in practice um, you know to our community all the time. And that's what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, who is it going to benefit? Uh, what are what is it going to be used for, and most importantly, how are things going to be different tomorrow than they are today um, after this technology is deployed? Um, and so ultimately, you know, and it's kind of a 
theme you'll hear from me a lot because I'm echoing um, my senior leadership as well is that you know all of our um, approaches to technology innovation aren't for a specific component, directorate, um, or a smaller organization. It's all about how do we, how does this support or enable the entire soft enterprise? And then from the soft enterprise, um, I think it's how does this uh, uh, enable the DOD enterprise? I'll turn it back to you, Bill. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Peter, uh, we've talked about technology integration issues from the operator and team level to the joint service-like soft environment. Now let's talk about some of the trends in the future. What are some of the key technology trends as you see them that might matter to the future of security and SOF? I think you can break it down into um, two ways to answer that question. One is what are some of the potentially game-changing technologies that are out there? And then secondly, uh, what might be some of the effects that they have on uh, the future operating environment and then uh, SOF and its role within it. Um, in terms of the technology areas, I think what is different than perhaps in past periods in history is um, that rather than having you know one key change going on, if you think you know a uh, hundred years back mechanization, or if you think uh, from the you know 1980s on to the culmination uh, into some of the the technology shown off um, in uh, the. Afghan and then Iraq war, that was the computer revolution. Um, now we've got multiple ones playing out. So on the hardware side, you have uh, robotics and increasingly autonomous robotics uh, becoming real, being deployed out there, basically breaking off into two types, either where you're looking at the machine as a partner, as a um, wingman, uh, so to speak, of the human, or where you are uh, shifting to incredibly small, but um, swarmed. So where it's not about quality, but quantity in terms of the unmanned systems. Uh, some of the you know examples that we've seen of that, I think you know we might look back at um, the recent war between um, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, where unmanned systems. You know, the question coming out of that was not uh, do unmanned systems have a role in the battlefield. The question was, does the tank still have a role on the battlefield? Now, I, I think it does, but the point is, is that we saw an incredibly skillful use of this new technology that basically um, cleaned the clocks of the other side. I think it, you know, what it took out like 80% of their armored force. Um, so hardware. Uh, second, you have the cluster of software that we've primarily spoken about, um, data science, uh, artificial intelligence, the shift in the internet to the internet of things, the rise of social media, um, all of that going on and how that gets weaponized. Um, the third area is waveware, uh, energy shifts, both new energy sources, but I think even more important, um, energy becoming a weapon itself. So for example, one of the counters to swarms of unmanned systems might be directed energy. Uh, and then um, EW, crossing with cyber, you name it. Um, and then finally, wetware human performance modification, using technology to change us and what we can do. Um, in each of these, I think, uh, you know, they're stunning in and of themselves. What maybe matters more is how they come together, how they connect and cross. So if you think about um, 3D printing, uh, that alters everything from um, how uh, special operations might think about its acquisition cycle, can make its own spare parts and make them even out in the field. It also changes when we think about adversary capability. They can manufacture their own weapons maybe out in the field. We've already seen, for example, um, 3D printed gun uh, factories in the UK. Um, but the point is, is 3D printing, that's software and hardware coming together. Uh, if you think back in military history, it's like how the blitzkrieg was air power and tank and wireless communication. That was the secret sauce. Same thing, um, I think, is what we're looking moving forward. Um, in terms of the implications for uh, the community and, and war writ large, um, there's a whole series of them. I think two that um, may be the most painful and challenging. The first is um, each of these technology areas uh, have 
inherently low barriers to entry. So it means that they will be widely proliferated. Um, this moving forward will not be a situation of um, us having a generation or two generations ahead of technology capability against our adversary, whether we're talking about uh, Soviet tanks or um, uh, the Taliban. Um, they may have the same or even, particularly we haven't dealt with this for about 75 years, better technology than us. And that may be um, a state actor like a China that's doing incredible work in robotics and AI and quantum, but also remember it could also be a non-state actor because of China being a new supplier of choice. Uh, so just like the AK-47 or the MiG-21 proliferated around the Cold War, even though we never sort of directly fought against the Red Army, the same thing you may see Chinese drones or EW AI out there. And so what I'm pointing to is the potential scenario for the US that we gave a Soviet pilot in Afghanistan in 1984, where they thought they were a generation ahead in technology, and then a Mujahideen rolled out with a Stinger missile uh, that they didn't have air defenses for. Could we face that kind of scenario? Um, we need to think about you know, what, how we would handle that. And then the second issue that's been touched on is um, because of these low barriers to entry, uh, it makes um, every battle, every fight multi-domain. So, um, and I think uh, Mark, Mark Nutch was speaking to this, you know, it's not just in, in great power competition where the adversary will have sensor data, will have electronic warfare. It also might be non-state actors. That also means that they will be able to target us with everything from small UAVs to cyber warfare, you name it. Again, whether you're facing off against a great power or a non-state actor, and that alters how you have to think about, um, you know, even down to how you defend ourselves. Uh, you've really not had to put a lot of investment or thought into um, EW defense and counterinsurgency or air defense and counterinsurgency. And you need to moving forward, let alone in a great power type warfare like we played with in, in Ghost Fleet. Thank you, Peter. Hey, I've, I'm getting, getting some questions here. Let me, let me direct one to uh, Mark Nooch. You know, uh, uh, you talked about adaptation and, and some of the examples I think in your read had talked about uh, shoot the horse SOP that uh, people get a little bit of a chuckle out of. And also, you know, when, when, when they use the, uh, uh, when they used the USS Kitty Hawk to provide soft forward operating base capabilities, uh, things like that. And I believe you also had talked a little bit about swarm, you know, Peter brought, mentioned the word swarm and it struck me that, that I think you, you had seen that on the battlefield. Can you talk a little bit about adaptation and how you had to adapt, uh, to the battlefield and to some systems that were given to you? Yeah. So we, uh, uh, had some some new fielded systems. The the embitter PRC one forty eight radios got fielded to every guy on our team, so we're literally uh, figuring those out. Just in the in, they've been newly fielded to the group just maybe a month or two prior to nine eleven happening. So we're we're di definitely diving into those. I know our radios uh, were incredible because of the smaller, compact, lightweight with that system at that time, uh, UHF, VHF, FM. But unfortunately, the procurement folks did not purchase the SATCOM-capable software for the soft-fielded radios. We show up with our interagency team, and they have the exact same radio that every one of their operators has, but their radios did include the SATCOM capability in the software. So it gave them you know, another advantage. Whereas my guys then were having to hump in another uh, specific SATCOM capable radio at that time, the PSC fives, or then they, they went to the PRC 117s. Uh, the other great piece of kit that we were all issued was everybody remember Garmin GPS Vistas. Uh, they were newly fielded as a, in Sportsman's Warehouse and Cabela's, and they ran on double A batteries you know, which you can find anywhere in the world versus a proprietary battery that came with the five pound uh, plugger at that time. That was the, uh, we were fielded two of those per ODA. 
But by every guy having that radio system, every guy having that little Garmin GPS, it, it now allowed you to do so many things from targeting to mapping out uh, drop zones uh, or caches or trailheads and sharing that. And I will remind folks that we were so far left in this, they didn't have the topographical data layer to issue us at that time. So you're just using that device and sharing that info, but it did not help you uh, navigate the terrain uh, you know, or even the road network. The guys are still having to read, read a map. Um, the shoot the horse SOP, I equate to our operators are going to go into battle and they will be the first amongst our DOD services, uh, most likely. That will have the best training that we can give them in the world. They'll have the best technology at that time that we can field, but they're going to have other encounters. In the case, none of us predicted that we would be riding horseback and none of us, you know, it's just by fate that myself and one of my sergeants grew up riding horses. We, but that was that austere part of the world where that resistance force was mainly moving around by horseback, which you think, oh, that's, that's antiquated, it's outdated. It gave them the all-terrain 24-7 off-road capability in the mountains where our enemy was restricted to the roads and trail networks, and they're tied to their fuel depots. So we recognize that uh, striking the fuel depots was a way to degrade their capability immediately. You know, we did some other, you know, unique service things then that I can't specifically talk to, but putting soft teams and 160th helicopters onto aircraft carriers gave us that, that floating base in the Indian Ocean uh, and allowed us, uh, you know, to bring those resources to bear in ways that, that we hadn't really seen before. Uh, all of this is gonna require a logistical tail, you know, and no more demonstrative than the aerial refueling capabilities that were critical uh, to my soft team employing nearly 300 airstrikes in 23 days. Uh, every one of those air crews had to have multiple aerial refuelings uh, so that technology, that planning and uh, forecasting had to be addressed as well. Uh, I just want to say, you know, I'm, I'm one of the guys that still is trying to understand AI and cyber. I appreciate what Colonel Zayas and your team and, and uh, Mr. Singer are doing as well. But I don't fully understand cyber and AI, but I know our soft teams need it and they need it forward, and they need it uh, because that's what's going to help them dominate on the battlefield with whatever force we're going up against. You know, in the case of my team, we sat down every day, uh, whether that was two of us or three of us, six of us or 12 of us, and we're like, what, you know, what nearly killed us today, and how do we prevent that from happening uh, again, and how can we win? on the battlefield. And I know that's what our soft teams are gonna be faced with, with whatever threat or mission they're assigned. Thank you, Mark. Hey, uh, this one, uh, let me direct this one to uh, uh, Colonel Zace. Uh, and this came, this came off the floor. What is the next level of soft slash technology integration? Will abstract human machine interaction be instrumental in the future? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably have to follow up on what he mean that person or he or she means by abstract human interaction. Um, and you know, I mean, it kind of goes to my earlier point. You know, the uh, you know, artificial general artificial artificial general intelligence is is a long ways away. Um, as is you know, you know, I don't think there's. Um, that many opportunities or reasons for a human out of the loop. Um, you know, I think there will always be a need to some degree in terms of decision making for human in the loop. Um, you know, there's some actually Chinese strategy documents that are that are that are out there and publicized, and they you know they kind of categorize um, uh, all their artificial intelligence, um, especially autonomous weapons, into three different categories. Um, uh, I think they call it uh, 
man outside the ring, man in the ring, and um, and the third one basically basically human out of the loop. I, I forgot the name of it. Um, you know, and they don't directly. You know, obviously there's plenty um, UN sanctions and laws that prevent that kind of um, technology, especially when it comes to autonomous weapons. But um, some of the intents of different countries are kind of vague, and, and they're especially when they the narrow definition of what they have for um, autonomous weapons and things like that. But um, so that's kind of maybe in a, a little rabbit hole in terms of the short answer is human in the loop. But I can you know I think that I always have a a play. Um, if it's more I guess out of a more complex answer, if it's kind of more towards our, you know, that's, there's a lot of intermediate steps that we have to go before it, um, kind of my theme earlier, there's um, becoming an AI enabled enterprise. Thank you, Colonel Zace. Uh, Peter, let me, let me direct this one to you, it's off the floor, uh, but it has to do with your AI smoothie. Uh, so what goes into an AI smoothie for the leaders forced to rely on technology for truth? So I want to be clear, it's not an, an it, the uh, concept of the smoothie is not specific to AI. It's the idea of utilizing nonfiction and narrative packaged together and much the way a smoothie combines, you know, the nutrients, the fruit and veggies with, with the sweet taste. Uh, we've deployed uh, the approach of this on um, the topic of AI, uh, obviously in, in the book um, Burn In, but we've also deployed it on uh, other um, topics that range from education to cybersecurity to unmanned systems, you name it. Uh, so the the smoothie on um, Burn In, the, the combination is basically you do the hard work of the research. Uh, so we brought together um, everything from the latest research papers about how does AI work, um, what is uh, algorithmic bias, which is a key challenge um, any user of AI or an autonomous system out in the field is going to face, um, what are the plans by groups that range from Amazon to the police to SOCOM on how they're going to utilize this technology uh, in a variety of different roles. Um, you combine that research, so it's like uh, 27 pages of research and notes um, with interviews of people. Uh, so interviews of everything from operators to uh, water systems engineers, which is how we were able to um, break the story, so to speak, of uh, huge cybersecurity vulnerabilities in our water systems. Uh, before the real world version of it happened um, a couple months ago. So you're taking that nonfiction side, but then instead of dumping it into a conventional white paper that again, you know, is a tough ask to get people to read, you package it within a scenario. Uh, so rather than saying here, read my five page paper on what algorithmic bias is, let's experience algorithm bias from the point of view of a, um, so the opening scene of burn-in is a, um, for Marine is entering a train station set about 15 years out and they're being fed a variety of data uh, from a variety of sources, much like any operator would face, but they have to deal with both the challenge of one, I've got a deluge of data, which of this data is actually valuable to me. But then the second the algorithm the bias side of it is understanding that that data, the AI is steering you to highlight certain things, but it's steering you to highlight it because it's been trained to do so for a certain scenario, a certain environment which may not be the exact situation that you face right now. Uh, and so as a human, you both have to figure out how to use that data, but you also have to be aware of the algorithmic bias issues in it. So we, we do that by packaging it within a story, which is basically the hunt for a terrorist in a crowd. That's a very easy to envision scenario. Hopefully your emotions picked up a little bit, a terrorist in a crowd at a train station, the ticking clock. But by the end of that read, you walk away from it with an understanding of this, you know, highfalutin concept of algorithmic bias that I think, you know, any leader is going to need moving forward. So that's that that combination. That's how we do it, and that's how we did it specific to that topic of AI. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me let me let me close this out. We're coming up on the uh, the end of the time here. Now we've talked about the past with the Missouri Sharif, the present in terms of of data science, and the future in terms of trends and the use of ficient or fictional intelligence. I, I'd like to thank the uh, the panelists for their participation, in particular, the thought provoking discussion from from various different perspectives. An operator, a data scientist, and a premier strategist. Uh, Colonel Zays, uh, Dr. Singer, and, and Mark Nuch, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Dr. Narn, to the rest of the team. I greatly appreciate the diverse backgrounds and perspectives that have gone into understanding technology in a very broad and highly meaningful way. As we did yesterday, we will now take a short lunch break and return later to discuss our fourth soft identity lens with two panels on diversity and inclusion in special operations. We'll see you soon.